The Life of St. Paul, a Google Earth tour by David Rudman, with text taken trustingly from the Book of Acts and all the Pauline epistles, exhaustively researched and pieced together with all but the most general theological themes removed so as to instead focus upon the chronological sequence of his life's events and travels. See the video description below for where you can get the script being read from here and the Google Earth KMZ file, as well as where you can donate or purchase more such classical world materials. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. I am a Jew born at Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, educated according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as you all are this day. Andronicus and Junius were my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They were men of note among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders bear me witness. And I did so in Jerusalem. I not only shut up many of the saints in prison by authority from the chief priests, but when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. When they cast Stephen out of the city and stoned him, the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of Saul, and Saul was consenting to his death. And on that day a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And I punished them often in all the synagogues, and tried to make them blaspheme, and in raging fury against them I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Thus I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he journeyed, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed about him. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining round about me, and those who journeyed with me. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. And I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you to serve and bear witness to the things in which you have seen me, and to those in which I will appear to you, delivering you from the people and from the Gentiles to whom I send you, to open their eyes, that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to, to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, 
Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise, and go to the street called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to the saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call upon thy name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the just one, and to hear a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling upon his name. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and took food and was strengthened. For several days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And in the synagogues immediately he proclaimed Jesus, saying, he is the Son of God. Wherefore, I was not obedient to the heavenly vision. I was, wherefore, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those at Damascus, then at Jerusalem, and throughout all the country of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God and perform deeds worthy of their repentance. And all who heard him were amazed, and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name on who called on this name? And he has come here for this purpose, to that to bring them before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus, by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and let him down over the wall, lowering him in a basket. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to him. And when many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down over the wall, lowering him in a basket. At Damascus, the governor under King Aretas, at Damascus, the governor under King Aretas guarded the city of Damascus in order to seize me. But I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall and escaped his hands. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom, to whom not only I but also all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the disciples, and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists but they were seeking to kill him. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, 
make haste and get quickly out of Jerusalem, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in every synagogue I imprisoned and beat those who believed in thee. And when the blood of Stephen thy witness was shed, I also was standing by and approving and keeping the garments of those who killed them. And he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And when the brethren knew it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it was multiplied. A.D. 32 to 35. But when he was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not confer with flesh and blood nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went away into Arabia. This is probably to Mount Sinai in Arabia, modern Jebel Laws. And again, I returned to Damascus. Then after three years, A.D. 35 to 37, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, and remained with him fifteen days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still not known by sight to the churches of Christ in Judea. They only heard it said that he who once persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to none except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number that believed turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, of course, because he knew that preaching to the Gentiles was his vocation, as in Acts 9, 15, 26, 15, and 26, 17 above. And when Barnabas had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a large company of people. And in Antioch the disciples were for the first time called Christians. Now in these days prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch, and one of them, named Agabus, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. And this took place in the days of Claudius. It would be in A.D. 46 to 47. And the disciples determined every one according to his ability to send relief to the brethren who lived in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. The First Missionary Journey Now in the church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Nager, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, a member of the court of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, 
Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived, arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of the God of God in the synagogues to the Jews, and they had John to assist them. They proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, Paul and his company set sail from Paphos, set sail from Paphos, Paul and his company set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John left them and returned to Jerusalem. But they passed on from Perga and came to Antioch of Pisidia. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with jealousy and contradicted what was spoken by Paul and reviled him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you, since you thrust it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we turn to the Gentiles. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of God. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord spread throughout all the region. But the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and leading men of the city and stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas, and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them, and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Now at Iconium there, they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord, who bore witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, and some with the apostles. When, when an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews, with their rulers, to molest them and stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia, and to the surrounding country. And there they preached the gospel. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, which was a healing at Lystra, they lifted up their voices, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul, because he was a chief speaker, they called Hermes. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was in front of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the people. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out. With these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came there from Antioch and Iconium. And having persuaded the people, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. But when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra to, and to Iconium and to Antioch, 
strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders, or priests, for them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they believed. Then they passed through Pisidia, and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia, and from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work which they had fulfilled. And when they arrived, they gathered the church together and declared all that God had done with them, and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, reporting the conversion of the Gentiles, and they gave great joy to all the brethren. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. Then, after fourteen years, since my previous trip to Jerusalem, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up by revelation, that is, of Agabus in Acts 11.28, and I laid before them, but privately before those who were of repute, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, lest somehow I should be sh running or had run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, corresponding to Acts 15.5 below, although he was a Greek, but because of false brethren secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to them we did not yield submission even for a moment, that the, that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. When they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, and when they perceived the grace that was given to me, James and Cephas and John gave to me and Barnabas, corresponding to Acts 15.12 below, the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles, only that they would have us remember the poor, which very thing I was eager to do. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider the matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter rose and said to them, But we believe that we shall be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And all the assembly kept silence. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, exhorted the brethren with many words and strengthened them. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brethren to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. The Second Missionary Journey And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the brethren in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord, and see how they are. And Barnabas wanted to take with them John, called Mark. 
But Paul thought best not to take with them one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to the work. And there arose a sharp contention so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And he came also to Derbe and to Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews that were in those places. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. And they went on their way through the cities. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions which had been reached by the apostles and elders who were at Jerusalem. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come opposite Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing, beseeching him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when he, when he had seen the vision, immediately we, meaning Luke now included, sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Setting sail, therefore, from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to give heed to what was said by Paul. And when she was baptized with her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. As we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners much gain by soothsaying. She followed Paul and us, crying, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. And Paul was annoyed and turned and said to the spirit, I, ch I charge you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace in front of the rulers. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. We had already suffered and been shamely treated at Philippi. Having received this charge, he put them into the inner pre prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the, of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's fetters were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And he called for lights and rushed in. And trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Men, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, 
you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once with all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced with all his household that he had believed in God. But when it was day, the magistrates sent the police, saying, Let these men go. And the jailer reported the words to Paul, saying, The magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore come out and go in peace. And Paul said to them, They have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens, and have thrown us into prison, and do they now cast us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and they took them out and asked them to leave the city. So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brethren, they exhorted them and departed. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. We want you to know, brethren, about the grace of God, which has been shown in the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own free will, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent me help once and again. This assistance from Philippi must have come here extremely early, right in Paul's second missionary journey, because he writes in Philippians 4.15 that only the Philippians helped to help him out, which means that it cannot be the financial assistance that he was taking back to Jerusalem on his third missionary journey, because that is described in Romans 15.26 as having also been contributed by Achaia. And Paul went in, as was his custom, and for three weeks he argued with them from the scriptures. And some of them were persuaded, and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. But the Jews were jealous, and taking some wicked fellows of the rabble, they gathered a crowd, set the city in an uproar, and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring them out to the, to the people. And when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brethren before the city authorities, crying, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them, and they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard this. And when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Beroia. And when they had arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing, as well as men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Beroea also, they came there too, stirring up and inciting the crowds. Then the, brethren, then the brethren immediately sent Paul off on his way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they departed. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, we were willing to be left at Athens alone, and we sent a message for Timothy, 
our brother, who had not yet returned, to first go to Thessalonica, to establish you in your faith and to exhort you that no one be moved by these afflictions. Now, while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who chanced to be there. Some also of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers met him, and some said, What would this babbler say? Others said, He seems to be a preacher of foreign di divinities, because he preached to Jesus and the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you present? Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, but others said, We will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from among them. But some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysus the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. After this, he left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome in AD 52, probably. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. And they worked, for by trade they were tent makers. And he argued in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with preaching, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with all his household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man shall attack you to harm you, for I have many people in this city. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. The first epistle, the ascending of the first epistle to the Thessalonians. This letter must have been written at Corinth because it is addressed from Timothy to Silas, or Silvanus in Latin, which means that they had returned, see Acts 17, 14 above. Also because it reports knowledge that the wrath of God has finally come upon the Jews, which is a probable allusion to both Claudius's expulsion of the Jews from Rome, which Priscilla and Aquila had just brought word of to Corinth in Acts 18.2, and an allusion also to the continual tumults and upheavals introduced by the Judean procurator Felix. You can see Josephus, Jewish, Jewish Antiquities, Book 20, Chapter 5, which lit the fuse for the destruction of the temple a decade later in 70. The focus of the letter is eschatology. In fact, the focus of both Thessalonian letters is eschatology, which means the end times. The church there at, Thess at Thessalonica already had a healthy admixture of Jews, see Acts 17, 1 and 4, which means they almost certainly already had a lot of apocalyptic eschatological beliefs. It is noteworthy that it contains allusions to the violence the Christians had just suffered, see Acts 17, 5 through 9, as well as two mentions of the wrath of God, a theological concept that would much later become the driving cause of Paul's entire epistle to the Romans. 1 Thessalonians Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians 
We give thanks, remembering your work of faith and, lo and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us what a welcome we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus, which are in Judea. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out, and displease God, and oppose all men. For God's wrath has come upon them at last. Therefore, and we sent a message for Timothy, our brother, who had not yet who had not returned yet to first go to Thessalonica to establish you in your faith and to exhort you that no one be moved by these afflictions but now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us the good news of your faith and love and indeed you do love all the brethren throughout Macedonia the sending of the second epistle to the Thessalonians this letter was probably also written at Corinth because it is also addressed from Timothy and Silas or Silvanus. And it talks about much the same things as in the first epistle. It even alludes to an overreaction among the Thessalonians to the first epistle, speaking of some of them as, quote, quickly shaken in mind, unquote, quote, excited either by spirit or by word or by letter purporting to be from us chapter 2, verse 2. Um, people living in idleness. Mere, also, people living. it alludes to people living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work, 3.11. This overreaction is, of course, understandable as they are still under persecution and affliction, chapter 1, verses 4 and 6. The focus of the letter, again, is more eschatology and holding on to the authentic church tradition. Your faith is growing abundantly, and the love is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast of you in the churches of God, for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions which you are enduring. God deems it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to be quickly shaken in mind or excited, either by spirit or by word or by letter purporting to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God proclaiming himself to be God. Do you, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you this? And you know what is restraining him, not so that he may... And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed, and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth, and destroy him by his appearing and his coming. The coming of the lawless one by the activity of Satan will be with all power and with pretended signs and wonders, and with all wicked deception for those who are to perish, because they refused to love the truth and so be saved. 
Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may speed on and triumph as it did among you, and that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. Now we command you, brethren, that you keep away from any brother who is living in idleness. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack upon Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading men to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, I should have reason to bear with you, O Jews. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Gallio paid no attention to this. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, and then took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, and then took leave of the brethren, and sailed for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. At Cenchreae he cut his hair, for he had a vow. And they came to Ephesus, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and argued with the Jews. When they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you, if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. Note, this would be in 52 to 53 AD, about four to five years since the Blessed Virgin had died at the house built for her by St. John on a hilltop about five miles to the south of Ephesus. Coordinates, 54 deg 37 degrees, 54 minutes, 42 seconds north, 27 degrees, 20 minutes, 32.33 seconds east. When he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and then went down to Antioch, the third missionary journey. After spending some time there, he departed and went from place to place through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Apollos. Now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, well versed in the scriptures. He had been taught in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the, the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him and expounded to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to receive him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who, through grace, had believed, for he powerfully confuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that he, the Christ was Jesus. Now, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus. And he entered the synagogue and for three months, soon to be followed by two more years after that, spoke boldly, arguing and pleading about the kingdom of God. But when some were stubborn and disbelieved, speaking evil of the way before the congregation, he withdrew from them, taking the disciples with him, and argued daily in the hall of Tyrannus. This continued for two years, so that all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and Greeks. And God did extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that handkerchiefs or aprons were carried away from his body to the sick, and diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva, or Skyva, were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Many also of their, those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. 
and a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord grew and prevailed mightily. Now, after these events, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem, saying, After I've been there, I must also see Rome. And having sent into Macedonia two of his helpers, Timothy and Erastus, he himself stayed in Asia for a while. Um, note, sending an epistle to the Galatians and Corinthians. Sending epistles to the Galatians and Corinthians. The sending of the epistle to the Galatians. This letter has to have been sent after the Council of Jerusalem, which takes up the bulk of Galatians 2. That rules out ascending during Paul's first missionary journey, which would have been even earlier. It was clearly sent soon after the Galatians' conversion. The central question then is whether they were converted and it was sent in the middle of Paul's second missionary journey or third missionary journey. The most likely answer is the third missionary journey for three reasons. First, it was probably sent just before the first epistle to the Corinthians because it is obliquely mentioned in 1 Corinthians 16.1. Second, Galatia arguably had not been evangelized, at least by Paul, until Paul's third missionary journey. See Acts 18.23 above. Because he had been forbidden to evangelize in those areas on his second missionary journey. Acts 16.6. Thirdly, the letter is addressed from Paul alone, but alludes to many other brethren with him in 1.2 which would have corresponded well to his situation at Ephesus in the middle of his third missionary journey after he had just sent away his two primary helpers into Macedonia, Acts 19.22. The focus of the epistle is against returning to the law of the Judaizers. Paul, an apostle, not from men, and all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Did you receive the Spirit? And does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Having begun with the Spirit, are you now ending with the flesh? Henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus." And to keep me from being too elated by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The sending of the first epistle to the Corinthians. This letter certainly occurs here because of 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 8. The occasion for it would have probably largely been the return of either Apollos, mentioned in 1, 4 and 16, 12, or someone from the house of Chloe, 1, 11, or of Stephanus, 1, 16 and chapter 16. From Corinth back to Ephesus, probably bringing word about the factionalism that the whole epistle deals with. The focus then is total unity of the church against factionalism. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God which is at Corinth, I give thanks to God always for you because of the grace of God which, has, which was given you in Christ Jesus that in every way you were enriched in him with all speech and all knowledge, note, by Apollos. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brethren. What I mean is that each one of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I am thankful that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, 
lest anyone should say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the, also the house of Stephanus. Be not, beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Now, concerning the contribution for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, clearly this was, note, clearly this was within a year of arriving at Corinth in the previous missionary journey, each of you is to put aside something and store it up as he may prosper so that contributions need not be made when I come. And when I arrive, I will send those whom you accredit by letter to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Note, possibly those in Acts 24. If it seems advisable that I should go also, they will, then they will accompany me. I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you, or even spend the winter, so that you may speed me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you, if the Lord permits. But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. When Timothy comes, as Timothy was already over in Macedonia, see Acts 19.22, Paul would have had to send him a letter to tell him to not yet go on to Corinth, as he will say here. When Timothy comes, I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 1. As I urged you, Timothy, to have remained there, i.e., before proceeding to Corinth, when I was at Ephesus going to Macedonia, that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. That was a reference to this particular situation back in 1 Timothy 1 3. This theological dis note, also, this theological disunity was seemingly common. For example, the Corinthians, among others, were doing it, and so Paul made his whole first letter to the Corinthians about reestablishing unity. See also, for instance, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 11. As I urged you, Timothy, to remain there, nor to, and to tell the church there not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the divine training that is in faith. See that you put him at ease among you, for he is doing the work of the Lord as I am. So let no one despise him. Speed him on his way in peace, that he may return to me, for I am expecting him with the brethren. As for our brother Apollos, note, who must have returned since Acts 19.1, I strongly urged him to visit you with the other brethren, but it was not at all his will to come now. He will come when he has opportunity. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Now, brethren, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. I urge you to be subject to such men and to every and to every fellow worker and laborer. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have made up for your absence, for they refreshed my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such men. The churches of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Prisca, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. All the brethren send greetings. About this time, there arose no little stir concerning the way. For a man named Demetrius, way. For a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen of similar occupation and said, riling them up. When they heard this, what he said about Paul, they were enraged and cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians, who were Paul's travel companions. Paul wished to go in among the crowd too, but the disciples would not let him. Some of the Asiarchs also, who were friends of his, sent to him and begged him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion, 
and most of them did not know why they had come together. Some of the crowd put forth Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander motioned with his hand, wishing to make a defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours they all with one voice cried out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! And when the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he dismissed the assembly. For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly, unbearably crushed that we despaired of life itself. Why, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and having exhorted them, took leave of them and departed for Macedonia. The sending of the second epistle to the Corinthians. This letter certainly occurs here because of its frequent mentions of having passed into Macedonia and of the collection. Its focus is getting people to contribute money after the Corinthians, led by our seeming rival of Paul's in chapter 2, verses 5 to 10, complained about being too poor or some similar objection, probably in an intervening letter that we no longer have. Compare also 8.3 and 8.12. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother, I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a double pleasure. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and then to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. It was to spare you, though, that I refrained from coming directly, that is, to Corinth. For I made up my mind not to make you another visit in pain. And I wrote as I did, note in some intervening unknown letter, so that when I come came, I might not suffer pain from those who should have made me rejoice. For I felt sure of all of you that my joy would be the joy of you all. For I wrote you out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I note at their refusal to donate, and with many tears, not to cause you pain, but to let you know the abundant love that I have for you. But if anyone has caused pain, he has caused it not to me, but in some measure, not to put it too severely, to you all. For such a one, this punishment by the majority is enough. So you should rather turn to forgive and comfort him, or he may be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. So I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. For this is why I wrote, that I might test you and know whether you are obedient in everything. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, a door was opened for me in the Lord. But my mind could not rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. For even when we came into Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus, and not only by his coming, but also by the coming with which he was comforted in you, as he told us of your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced still more. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter grieved you, though only for a while. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For see what earnestness this, good, good, this godly grief has produced in you, what eagerness to clear yourselves, what indignation, what alarm, what longing, what zeal, what punishment. At every point you have proved yourselves guiltless in this matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not on account of the one who did the wrong, nor on account of the one who suffered the wrong, but in order that your zeal for us might be revealed to you in the sight of God. The grace of God has been shown in the churches of Macedonia, for in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of liberality on their part. Accordingly, we have urged Titus 
that as he had already made a beginning, he should also complete among you the gracious work. I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of equality, your abundance at the present time should supply their want. For Titus not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he is going to you of his own accord. With him we are sending the brother who is famous among all the churches for his preaching. Note, probably Apollos. For his preaching of the gospel. And not only that, but he has been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work which we are carrying on for the glory of the Lord and to show our good will. And with them we are sending our brother, note, Timothy? See chapter 2, verse 1, whom we have often tested and found earnest in many matters. I thought it necessary to urge the brethren to go on to you before me and arrange in advance for this gift you have promised. Here for the third time I am ready to come to you. I was crafty, you say, and got the better of you by trickery. Did I take advantage of you through any of those whom I sent to you? I urged, I urged Titus to go and sent the brother with him. Did Titus take advantage of you? When he had gone through these parts, when he had gone through these parts and given them much occurrence, when he had gone through these parts and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews, as he was about to sail for Syria, he determined to return through Macedonia. Sopater of Beroia, the son of Pyrrhus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus, and Secundus, and Gaius, of Derby, also Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. Note, these are possibly the various cities' carriers of their respective contributions to Jerusalem. See 1 Corinthians 6.3. The sending of the epistle to the Romans. There are three possible moments when Paul could have sent a letter to the Romans. The first two make not much sense. The third is the one we will go with. The first possibility. Towards the end of his second missionary journey in Acts 18.1, that is, the moment he arrived in Corinth, but before Priscilla and Aquila arrived. This would be a case of Paul's letter to the Romans unluckily missing them, indeed missing all the Christian Jews in Rome as they all come fleeing the other way from Claudius's expulsion. And this based upon the identity of the letter bearer, namely Phoebe, see Romans 16.1 a deaconess from near Corinth. So that's not very likely. Another possibility. Perhaps it was sent from Ephesus at the start of his third missionary journey when he resolves to go to Rome, when he resolves in the spirit to go to Rome. And this based upon that quote in verse 21, as well as upon the identity of his host, um, as who is Gaius, see Romans 16.23, who of the two reputed Gaiuses, Gaius of Thessalonica, Macedonia, on the one hand, and Gaius of Ephesus, on the other hand. Um, this one may have been Gaius of Ephesus. The third and most likely possibility is that Romans was sent in Thessalonica during the return of his third missionary journey, at the home of Gaius of Thessalonica, the Macedonian, because he is the most and only positively attested Gaius, even being mentioned without any introduction in Acts 19.29. And because there is mention in Acts 23 of, of him first spending three months in Greece, and second, of a plot made against him by the Jews, and third, of Gaius of the Thessalonians accompanying him in Acts 20, verse 4 which first two things could match well the situation described in Romans 15.23, that he has no longer any room for work in these regions of Greece and Macedonia, and also compare verse 26, especially since it's literally the exit point of his journey from these two regions, and which third thing well matches Gaius as being his host in Romans 16.23, since we just said above that he was a Thessalonian, so it is logical that his house would be there, and not, as is commonly supposed, in Corinth. A key confirming thing would be to see whether there, there is also record of an Erastus as a city treasurer of Thessalonica, 
see Romans 16.23. Lastly, this is the best choice because Paul's collection in Romans 15 verses 25 to 27 had to have taken place in his third missionary journey because that same collection is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8, just after he said in 2 Corinthians 2.12, see also 1 Corinthians 16.9, that he had found an open door to preach in Troas. A comparison of this with Acts 16.6-10 6 and 19.22 reveals, re, respectively reveals that Paul had first a closed door to preach at Troas in his second missionary journey, but then an open door to preach there in his third missionary journey. So the collection had to occur after this open door, i.e. in the third missionary journey, and in the latter returning half of it, not the start first outgoing half of it. That, so it had to have occurred after he had already once passed through Tro Troas. Only then, on the way back, would the, would the epistle to the Romans would the epistle to the Romans be sent, speaking of having already taken up that collection. Obviously, we are going with the third option here, that it was written at Thessalonica on his way back from Greece and Macedonia on his third missionary journey. The focus of the letter is justification of fallen human nature as something coming through Christ, not through Judaism or its law. law. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain. Note, Paul would never make that journey. And I hope to then be sped on by from there by you on my journey, once I have enjoyed your company for a little while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem with aid for the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. When therefore I have completed this, and I have delivered to them what has been raised, I shall go on by way of you to Spain. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess of the church at Cenchreae, a city near Corinth, that you may receive her in the Lord as befits the saints, and help her in whatever she may require from you. For she has been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I, but also all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks. Note, therefore they probably risked their necks before his first missionary journey. Greet also the church in their house. Greet my beloved Epinitus, who was the first convert in Asia for Christ. Greet Mary, who has worked hard among you. Greet Andronicus and Junius, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. They are men of note among the apostles, and they were in Christ before me. Grant Ampliatus, my beloved in the Lord. Greet Urbanus, our fellow worker in Christ, and my beloved Stachys. Greet Apelles, who is approved in Christ. Greet those who belong to the family of Aristobulus. Greet my kinsman Herodion. Greet those in the Lord who belong to the family of Narcissus. Greet those workers in the Lord, Trephina and Trephosa. Greet the beloved Persis, who has worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, eminent in the Lord, also his mother and mine. This may, note, this may be Rufus, the son of Simon of Cyrene. Greet Asyncritus, Plagon, Hermes, Petrobus, Hermas, and the brethren who are with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ greet you. I appear to, appeal to you, brethren, to take note of those who create dissensions and difficulties in opposition to the doctrine which, have been, which you have been taught. Avoid them, for such persons do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. And by fair and flattering words, they deceive the hearts of the simple-minded. For while your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you, I would have you be wise as to what is good and guileless as to what is evil. 
Then the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you. So do Lucius from Antioch in Acts 13, and Jason and Sosipater, my kinsmen. I, Tertius, the writer of this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, who is host to me and to the whole church, greets you. Erastus, the city treasurer, and our brother Quartus greet you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed and through the prophetic writings is made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. These namely Sosipater of Baroia and of the Thessalonians Aristarchus and Secundus and Gaius, of Derbe, also Timothy, and the agents Tychicus and Trophimus. These all went on and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days we came to the, them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. Eutychus was standing, was sitting in the window. He sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer in the night. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and embracing him said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them for a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the lad away alive, and were, and were not a little conf comforted. But going ahead to, to the ship, we set sail for Assos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he met us at Assos, we took him on board, and came to Mytilene. And sailing on from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos. And the day after that we came to Miletus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, bound in the Spirit, not knowing what shall befall me there except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions wait, await me. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to care for the church of God which he have obtained with the, the blood of his own Son. And when he had spoken thus, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And they all wept and embraced Paul and kissed him sorrowing most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they should see his face no more, and they brought him to the ship. And when we had parted from them and set sail, we came by a straight course to Kos, and the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And having found a ship crossing to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had come in sight of Cyprus, leave, leaving it on the left, we sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload its cargo. And having sought out the disciples, we stayed there for seven days. Through the Spirit, they told Paul not to go on to Jerusalem. And when our days there were ended, we departed and went on our journey. And they all, with wives and children, brought us on our way till we were outside the city. And kneeling down on the beach, we prayed and bade one another farewell. Then we went on board the ship, and they returned home. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemaeus, later known as Acre, and we greeted the brethren and stayed with them for one day. <laughs> on the morrow, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip, the evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. And he had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While, while we were staying for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, 
And coming to us, he took Paul's girdle, his belt, and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this girdle and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be imprisoned, but even to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, The will of the Lord be done. After these days we made ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Manasin of Cyprus, an early disciple from whom we should lodge, with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the priests, or elders, were, were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of, of those who have believed. They are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or observe the customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Do therefore this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so, so that they may shave their heads. This would have been done in a corner of Herod's temple, which was dedicated to the Nazarites, um, for the Nazarites to finally ceremonially cut their hair and be released from their vows. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they have been told about you, but that you yourself live in observance of the law. But as, as for the Gentiles who have believed, we have sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood, and from, what is and from what is strangled, and from unchastity. Then Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself with them, and went into the temple to give notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled, and the offering presented for every one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, who had seen him in the temple, stirred up all the crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching men everywhere against the people and the law into this place. Moreover, he also brought Greeks into the temple, and he has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was aroused, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were trying to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd shouted one thing, some another. And as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying, Away with him! As Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, he said to the tribune, May I say something to you? And he said, Do you know Greek? Are you not the Egyptian, then, who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? Paul replied, I'm a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. I beg you, let me speak to the people. And when he had given him leave, Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying, his life story until they would hear no more up to this word they listened to him then they lifted up their voices and said away with such a fellow from the earth for he ought not to live and as they cried out and waved their garments and threw dust into the air 
air, the tribune commanded him to be brought into the barracks and ordered him to be examined by scourging to find out why they shouted thus against him. Paul said, But I was born a citizen. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him instantly, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had bound him. But on the morrow, desiring to know the real reason why the Jews accused him, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And Paul, looking intently at the council, said, Brethren, I have lived before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. But when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brethren, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. With regard, respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn in pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified about me at Jerusalem, so you must bear witness also at Rome. When it was a day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath, neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of the ambush, and he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not yield to them. For more than forty of their men lie in ambush for him, having bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for the promise from you. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, Tell no one that you have heard me of, heard, have informed me of this. Then he called two of the centurions and said, At the third hour of the night, get ready two hundred soldiers with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen to go as far as Caesarea. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor, which, note, would make it 52 to 60 AD, somewhere in that area, in that era. And he wrote a letter to this effect, probably closer to 52. And he wrote a letter to this effect, Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greeting. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them. When I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen, and desiring to know the charge on which they accused him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was accused about questions of their, of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the morrow, they returned to the barracks, leaving the horsemen to go on with him. When they came to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked to what province he belonged. When he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will hear you when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. And after five days, the high priest Ananias came down with some elders and a spokesman, one Tertullus. They laid before the governor their case against Paul. For we have found this man a pestilent fellow, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. And when the governor had motioned to him to speak, Paul replied, Realizing that for many years you have been judge over this nation, I cheerfully make my defense. As you may ascertain, it is not more than twelve days since I went up to worship at Jerusalem. And they did not find me disputing with anyone or stirring up a crowd, either in the temple or in the synagogues or in the city. But this I admit to you. 
with respect to the resurrection of the dead, I am on trial before you this day. But Felix, having a rather accurate knowledge of the way, put them off, saying, When Lysias the tribune comes down, I will decide your case. Then he gave orders to the centurion that he should be kept in custody, but should have some liberty, and that none of his friends should be prevented from attending to his needs. After some days, Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewess, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak upon faith in Christ Jesus. And as he argued about justice and self-control and future judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I have an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. But when two years had elapsed, which would make it 58 to 60 AD, Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. And desiring to do the Jews a favor, Felix left Paul in prison. Now when Festus had come into his province, he went down to Caesarea, and the next day he took his seat on the tribunal and ordered Paul to be brought. And when he had come, the Jews who had gone down from Jerusalem stood, bef uh, stood around him, bringing against him many serious charges which they could not prove. Paul said in his defense, Neither against the law of the Jews, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I offended at all. I appeal to Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, You have appealed to Caesar. To Caesar you shall go. Now when some days had passed, Agrippa the king and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to welcome Festus. And Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish people petitioned me, both at Jerusalem and here, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. But I found that he had done nothing deserving death, and as he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. But I have nothing definite to write to my lord about him. Therefore, I have brought him before you, especially before you, King Agrippa, that after we have examined him, I might have something to write. For it seems to me unreasonable in sending a prisoner not to indicate the charges against him. Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. And Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. For this reason, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day, I have had the help that comes from God. And so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to the people and to the Gentiles. Then the king rose, and the governor and Bernice, and those who were sitting with them, and when they had withdrawn, they said to one another, This man is doing nothing to deserve death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And when it was decided that we should set sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramidium, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly, and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus, because the winds were against us. And when we had sailed across the sea, which is off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found a ship of Alexandria sailing for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty off Cnidus. And as the wind did not allow us to go on, we sailed under the lee of Crete off Salmoni. Coasting along it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which was the city of Lassia. As much time had been lost and the voyage was already dangerous because the fast had already gone by, 
Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the captain and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. And when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete, close inshore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the Northeaster struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven. And running under the lee of a small island called Cauda, we managed with difficulty to secure the boat. After hoisting it up, they took measures to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they should run, a, run upon the Sirtis, they lowered the gear, and so were driven. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were drifting across the Sea of Hadria, or the Adriatic, about midnight the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. As day was about to dawn, Paul urged them all to take some food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have continued in suspense and without food, having taken nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food. It will give you strength, since not a hair of your heads is to perish from any of you. And when he had said this, he took bread, and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then they all were encouraged and ate some food themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. And when they had eaten enough, they made for the beach. But striking a shoal, they ran the vessel aground, and, s and so it was that all escaped to the land. After we had escaped, we then learned that the island was called Malta. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island, named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospi hospitably for three days. They presented many gifts to us, and when we sailed, they put on board whatever we needed. After three months, we set sail in a ship which had wintered in the island, a ship of Alexandria with the twin brothers, the Gemini, as figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. And from there we made a circuit and arrived at Regium. And after one day, a south wind sprang up, and on the second day we came to Puteoli. There we found brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. And the brethren there, when they heard of us, came as far as the Forum of Appius and three taverns to meet us. On seeing them, Paul thanked God and took courage. And when we came into Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier that guarded him. And he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ quite openly and unhindered. It seems that during his captivity, while waiting for trial in Rome, Paul was able to avail himself of a winter vacation opportunity here in Nicopolis, probably because one of his assigned guards had offered him the opportunity. This is based upon five things. A brief mention of the city and his intentions in Titus 3.12, also 2 Timothy 4.10, Paul's evident privileges, including ingratiation with the Praetorian Guard in Philippians 1.13. Also, the necessity of being outside Rome in order to write the letter to the Hebrews, which was to the Jewish community at Rome. And then finally, his request for a, quote, lawyer, unquote, in Titus 3.13, which would have been in abundance had he been in Rome itself. It was here during this short winter that Paul therefore sent five letters, including his three most theologically profound ones, Colossians, Hebrews, and Ephesians. The name of the city as Victory City, or Nicopolis, was ironically fitting because while it historically commemorated the nearby 31 BC naval victory, of Emperor Octavian Augustus's fleet over the fleet of Mark Antony and Cleopatra, 
Yet here it provided Paul with the reflection matter in which he foresaw his own coming death, his, quote, putting off of the flesh, close quotes, Colossians 3.15, 3, with him lamenting in 2 Timothy and also maybe Philippians that his friends had deserted him, see 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 16, and that he was, quote, on the point of being sacrificed, that at the time of his departure, having finished the race, fought the good fight and won the crown, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 7. Um, the final eight letters of his life can each be divided into groups of four sets of groups of two. So the first two are the letters to his subordinates, Timothy and Titus, which are, were both bishops. So these are the epistles to bishops on, on mainly how to run a church. Paul's first two letters are very similar, both dealing with expectations of the various groups in the church, such as men, women, widows, slaves, those in holy orders, subjects. Um, also dealing with hierarchical holy orders. Um, deacons were the lowest of the three levels. Then priests, often called elders. And then highest were bishops, called overseers, episcopoi. Um, they also often deal with rebuking speculation about genealogies. We see that in 1 Timothy 1.4 and Titus 3.9. And they also deal with slavery somewhat. Um, that's in 1 Timothy 6, 1 through 2, and Titus 2, 9 through 10. And on this count, they are similar to the next subgroup of slavery addressing letters, namely Colossians and Philemon. Both of these letters also are signed by Paul alone, which is unique, and therefore makes them similar in time during his imprisonment among these final Nic Nicopolitan epistles. However, they necessarily come before Ephesians and Colossians, and, and Philemon too, because Paul thinks to send Artemis or Tychicus to replace Titus in Crete, to see Titus 3.12, but then obviously goes with Artemis instead, sending Tychicus instead, and much later to Ephesus, see Ephesians 6.21, and sending him also to Colossae, Colossians 4.7 where Tychicus was obviously staying at the end of Paul's life, as witnessed by Paul's nearly last letter in 2 Timothy 4.12. The first letter, the epistle to Titus. This letter was obviously the first and actually written before Paul arrives at Nicopolis, but still very much it is of the same spirit as the other Nicopolitan epistles. Um, the evidence that it was before he got there to Nicopolis is in Titus 3.12. It was written probably not at Rome, because Paul is alone, but maybe somewhere in between Rome and Nicopolis, maybe in southern Italy or northern Greece, such as Dalmatia or Epirus. The focus is on oikonomia, economy, household management. Not the management of a proper household, but the management of the household of the faith, of the local church. Paul, in a, ser a servant of God, to Titus, my true child in a common faith. This is why I left you in Crete, that you might amend what was defective and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. When I send Artemis or Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Do your best to speed Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their way. See that they lack nothing. Paul's next epistle was his first epistle to Timothy. From extra scriptural sources, such as the Roman Martyrology, it is traditionally believed that Timothy was a bishop at Ephesus. Also, or even perhaps exclusively, based upon the more common interpretation of 1 Timothy 1.3, which could seem to speak of Timothy as currently remaining at Ephesus, rather than, as that verse was interpreted here, of him as previously remaining ahead in Macedonia while Paul was at Ephesus. This ambiguity is somewhat inconsequential because it only impacts our view of Timothy's own situation, not Paul's situation. So it doesn't impact the order of letters here because it wouldn't hurt for this letter to be going to Timothy in Ephesus or Timothy anywhere else such as maybe at his hometown of Derby. Regardless, 
Timothy is clearly a young ordained bishop. See 2 Timothy 1.6. Probably somewhere in Asia, 2 Timothy 1.15, trying to run the, quote, household of God, unquote, in much the same situation as Titus, whom Paul had just mes messaged. Among the Nicopolitan letters, this letter is also clearly early because Paul is positive about his imprisoned situation, even hoping to some soon come visit various places if possible. 3.14 and 4.13. The letter has several similarities to 2 Timothy. Um, there are references to Hymenaeus, see 2 Timothy 2.17, and Alexander, 2 Timothy 4.14. And Paul's use of the phrase fight the good fight in 1 Timothy 1.18 and 6.12 and 2 Timothy 4.7. Both of these things perhaps belying Paul's subconsciousness that he is surrounded by military memorials and honors there at Nicopolis, the site of the great victory. The focus, again, is on oikonomia, or household management of the local church. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by command of God our Savior and of Christ Jesus our hope, to Timothy, my true child in the faith. As I urged you, and you can go with one of two translation interpretations here, first, our interpretation, as I urged you to remain then when I was going to Macedonia, or you could take the more common interpretation, as I urged you, remain now, at Ephesus, in any case, remain, that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these instructions to you so that, if I am delayed, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church. Let no one despise your youth. Till I come, attend to the public reading of scripture, to preaching, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have which was given you by prophetic utterance when the council of elders or priests laid their hands upon you. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Um... It's a good idea to keep track of where others of Paul's associates were at this time. In Colossians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God and Timothy, our brother. So Paul and Timothy are there. Um, in Colossians 4.10, we're going to see Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. And Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So those th three people are there, too. We'll be there in these next group of letters. Um... Lastly, in Philemon, we see the same thing. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, Damas, and Luke, my fellow workers. In other words, the same four or five people. Um, as, so, as for messengers, it's going to be Tychicus. Um, Tychicus will tell you about my affairs. He's beloved brother and faithful minister. I've sent him to you for this purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Aristarchus greets you, so does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions. If he comes to you, receive him. All right, the epistle to the Colossians. So this is the first in the next group of two. We just had the first group of two, which was the letters to bishops. Now we're going to get the two letters to a church that Paul had never actually visited, Colossae. And they seem to, well, at least one of the two, deals solely with slavery. This letter was sent to three perhaps unvisited adjacent towns in the Meander River Valley of Asia Minor, of which Laodicea, one of those three towns, would later reappear in John's Apocalypse as the church of lukewarmness, which Christ would, quote, spit out of his mouth, Revelation 3.16. In the letter, Paul rejoices that, quote, the whole world, i.e. even communities he has, not yet, he has not yet met, is bearing fruit and growing so much, close quote. Not knowing this church, and presumably neither knowing its vices, 
Paul unloads an entire cosmological perspective, an entire worldview from which those churches should be able to, at least in theory, deduce generally right thinking in response to the arguments of all the world's philosophies and religions with which Christianity is competing. The focus then is on the authentic kingdom of Christ as disarming the principalities and powers of the world's kingdoms. This letter is famous also for having the most sublime Christology in the whole Bible. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy our brother to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ at Colossae. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which you have. Indeed, in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, so much among yourselves from the day you heard as you learned it from Epaphras, our f beloved fellow servant, who is a faithful deacon of Christ among you, over you. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness, Christ has, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. I'm sorry, God has. God has, he, God, has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven, in heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. And you, who were dead in trespasses, God made alive together with him, having canceled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, trying thing over them in himself. And here it is fitting to mention the church of Laodicea, which was called Faithful and True, with the promised reward that they shall sit down on my throne, those who are faithful in it. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not knowing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire, that you may be rich, and white garments to clothe you, and to keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and salve to anoint your eyes that you may see. Those whom I love I reprove and chasten, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. He who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me upon my throne as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Also, this city is mentioned in Colossians 4.13 as having been served by Colossae's deacon Epaphras. There's also Hierapolis, which is a city mentioned in Colossians 4.13 as the third of the three cities and also was served by Epaphras, Colossians, Colossae's deacon. The other letter that was likely 
set, sent together with the epistle to the Colossians at the exact same time was a private letter um, named the letter to Philemon. It is even possible that Onesimus himself, the runaway slave about whom this letter speaks, was its very deliverer. Indeed, Paul displays an astonishing supernatural trust in the naturally impossible, claiming to pay for the slave's debts, verse 18, even though Paul himself is in prison, verses 1 and 23, claiming to come to visit them, verse 22, even though he is in prison, claiming to declare the slave formerly useless but now useful to both of us, verse 11, presumably because he was not a Christian back then but is a Christian now. In all these things, Paul manifests a trust in the supernatural for meriting, changing, and valuing the future. So, Paul displays an astonishing supernatural trust in seemingly naturally impossible things in this letter. The focus, then, is slavery within the kingdom of God. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Appia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an ambassador, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but by your own free will. Perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, as a beloved brother. If he has wronged you at all, or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it, to say nothing of your owing me, even your own very selves. The next, next and third of the four pairs of letters um, follows upon an event in life, in Paul's life, of abandonment of him by his mm, associates. It seems that two events in Paul's life may have combined to, to cause him to write these two letters. First, the ominous threat of a looming trial, Ephesians 6, 18-19. Second, his abandonment by all his circle of helpers. 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 12, thus leaving him lots of free time to write two truly gigantic epic letters. Timothy seems to be in jail somewhere, so he's gone. Maybe off at Ephesus. See Hebrews 13, 23, 2 Timothy 4, 13 to 14, 4, 19, and 1, 15 to 18. And being in jail would explain why this letter is not addressed either to or from him, which we might expect, given that this letter is to the Ephesians. Um, other people that are not pre pre present and have abandoned Paul. Demas, and probably Aristarchus too, seem to have gone off to Aristarchus's home of Thessalonica. Other people. Tychicus and Mark seem to have been sent off to Ephesus. Titus has gone to Dalmatia. Dalmatia? Luke and Epaphras seem to have disappeared for some unknown reason, although Luke will reappear later in Rome. Consequently, Paul writes and signs these letters by himself, alone. The result was two epistles that magnificently comprehend the summit and synthesis of Paul's theology, conveying an entire worldview within their respective topics. These two epistles are Ephesians, and Hebrews, and they are the two summits of Paul's theology, 
Ephesians being the more general one, applying to both Gentiles and Jews, regarding the whole church, and then Ephes and then, then Hebrews covering the specific ways in which Christ's life fulfilled the uniquely Jewish and especially priestly symbolism of the Messiah. Paul himself confesses that these epistles contain a complete synthesized worldview. Quote, when you read this, you can perceive my great insight into the mystery of Christ. I supplied the word great there. Ephesians 3, 4. Um, so this is not elementary doctrine, but maturity. Hebrews 6, 1. First, the epistle to the Ephesians. This epistle is sent to the most flourishing church of Asia. And if Revelation 2 is any indication, a church that that this, this church had known the recent presence of the Apostle John and of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and now likely St. Timothy as its bishop. As such, it was exceedingly blessed with spiritual gifts, the quintessential example of all that a local church can be. And this is symbolized in chapter 2 of the book of Revelation by the seven-branched candlestick, where each branch represents one particular church, as we learn from the earlier from the earlier two chapters. This letter, therefore, concerns the fullness of all that the church can become. It's first, and it also has very methodical geometric symmetry, um, or at least recapitulation. Its first three chapters of six chapters total are speculative. Its final three chapters are practical. The first three chapters lay out the plan for the church respectively, going up in the number of dimensions of the church. Chapter 1, one-dimensionally, lays out the church, discuss, discussing one-dimensional goal-oriented goal concepts, such as our predestination and hope. Chapter 2, two-dimensionally, lays out the church, identifying the floor plan of the two groups who shall be brought together and united when the building is built, namely Jews and Gentiles. Chapter 3, three-dimensionally lays out the church's, quote, breadth, length, and height, and depth, close quotes, 318. The final three chapters, then, respectively touch on the topics of unity in chapter 4, walking circumspectly in chapter 5, and enumerating the various obligations within the church of people within the church in chapter 6. The book has many major themes from previous letters. Like Romans, we see re-mentioned the wrath of God, Romans 1.18, also Ephesians 2.3 and 5.6. Like Romans, in, we also see predestination, Romans 8, 29 to 30, Ephesians 1, 5, and 1, 11. We also see salvation by grace, not of works, in Romans 4, 16, also in Ephesians 2, 5, and 2, 8. Similarly to Colossians, we see mentioned the abolished division between the Gentiles and Jews in Christ's body, Colossians 1, 15 to 19, and also Ephesians 2, 14 to 16. And like Hebrews, we see mention of sitting in the heavenly places, Hebrews 10, 12, and Ephesians 2, 16. This letter was probably sent from Nicopolis just before Paul was remanded back to Rome because it is signed by Paul alone, but is referenced in another later letter that was certainly sent from Rome, namely see 2 Timothy 4, 12, and compare that with Ephesians 6, 21. Additionally, Paul asked for prayers that, he, he, that utterance may be given to me to open my mouth to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, unquote. This request seems to hearken to a looming future trial, perhaps even at the ha hands of Emperor Nero himself. The focus of the letter is on construction of the corporate church, which is Christ's body. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. For he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ, to unite all things in him. For this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, 
assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by, to me by revelation. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. That is, how the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. For building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every joint with which it is supplied, when each part is working properly, makes bodily growth and upbuilds itself in love. Pray also for me, that utterance may be given me, and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Now that you also may know how I am and what I am doing, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, will tell you everything. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. The Letter to the Hebrews it is curious that Hebrews is the one book that, that does not begin with Paul's standard byline, such as Paul, an apostle, to so-and-so. Um, the big question is which Hebrews he is writing to. It is unlikely that it was the Hebrews at Ephesus because in it Paul mentions that Timothy was in jail at this time. Um, see Hebrews 13.23. And that would probably be in Ephesus itself. And so if Paul was writing this letter to Jews at Ephesus, it would mean that Paul was informing them of something happening in their own local neighborhood, which would make no sense. Um, so it, it's unlikely that it's written to Jews there. It could also be written to Jews in the Holy Land, but that is unlikely also because those Jews would already know all the minutiae of all the priestly offices that are discussed in the epistle. And so they would not need it so exhaustively explained to them. Furthermore, Jews in the Holy Land wouldn't be taking up a collection for the saints because they are the recipients of such collections. Um, see that mentioned in Hebrews 6.10. So, since it's not either of those two most likely Jewish communities, um, the, there are really two clues as to which alternative Jewish community it was probably sent to. And the first one of these is in 1324, where Paul says, All the brethren who come from Italy greet you. Um, the other one is in 1323. Paul intends to visit them if Timothy comes to him. So between these two, perhaps you can already guess which Jewish community this is probably talking about. Um, Rome. Why? Well, because Paul would be in prison under guard by his local centurion, and so he would not have the choices to go wherever he wants to. So for him to, although it's true he does intend to visit other places throughout the world that would be physically impossible for him, and only possible if he were acquitted from his charges. Yet, um, still, it's most likely that he is going to come and visit those who it is possible for him to visit, which would be those at Rome. The other reason is that um, all the brethren coming from it Italy would probably have be a reference to the expulsion by Emperor Claudius, see Acts 18.2, of all the Jews in, expelled in mass. After all, where would they be gathering um, where Paul, and Paul also would be writing from? Well, probably some place just outside of the province of Italy, um, such as what we've suggested here, namely Nicopolis. So this second clue also suggests Rome because that's where Paul's jailers, um, yeah, so right. 
So, the focus of the letter is Christ's eternal priesthood. Hebrews. In many and various ways God spoke of old to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by a son. In speaking of a new covenant, he treats the first as obsolete, and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with human hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, taking not the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience, desiring to act honorably in all things. You should understand that our brother Timothy has been released, with whom I shall see you if he comes soon. Thus, that completes the third of the four pairs of letters and from Paul's captivity. The final pair of letters from Paul's captivity are going to be 2 Timothy and Philippians. Both of these contain references to Paul's subtle awareness that his life is in danger and may be ending, and yet his overpowering joy and faith, even such. Um, not seeing this as, at all as a setback, but merely as his putting off of the flesh, as he says, to so as to be with the Lord. First comes, chronologically comes Second Timothy, containing the famous line, I have run the good race, I have fought the good fight. This letter is basically Paul's last will and testament as an apostle to his successor. C one six. Timoth and which successor to Timothy, in view of the developing disaster in the courts, in which the hearings seem to be turning against Paul. C four sixteen. So that he is now in doubt of his life, four six through eight and four eighteen. See seemingly owing to a denunciation by one Alexander the coppersmith. Four fourteen. Compare also Acts 19, 33 to 34, and 1 Timothy 1, 20. The letter is almost certainly written from Rome, not from Nicopolis. So Paul has by now, in this last pair of, of the four pairs of letters, Paul has now been remanded back to Rome to finally actually stand trial. Um, and in fact, this particular letter has already occurred after the first defense that he gave. And that is mentioned in 416. So that's one evidence that it's already back in Rome. There are three other pieces of evidence that it's already back in Rome. Um, first, there's a particular mention of a recent event occurring in Rome in 115 to 17. And then there are local names which sound particularly Roman, not Greek, such as Pudanes, Linus, and Claudius or Claudia. Um, lastly, there's the evidence of Paul's abandonment by numerous associates which, who would probably be abandoning him in response to great fear at a very powerful secular authority, such as you would find in Rome, not as you would find out in Nicopolis or the other military bases scattered about. The letter is written to Timothy, who is likely in Ephesus. We'd, based on four pieces of evidence. First, there's a greeting to the household of a man, Onesiphorus, and that man is listed among the, quote, Asians, close quote, C419 and 116. Of course, Ephesus is in Asia. Second, a return route for Timothy would have to come from the regions where Mark was last seen, C411, and namely Colossae, see Colossians 4.10. And then the return route would have to pass through Troas, see 1 Timothy 4.13. And all of this was in the vicinity of Ephesus, so that is more reason to suppose that it, it is being sent to Ephesus. Thirdly, um, mention of the Ephesians, and particularly Alexander the coppersmith. There's mention of an Ephesian, Alexander the coppersmith, 
in 4.14. See also Acts 19.33-34 and 1 Timothy 1.20. And then lastly, there are extra scriptural traditions such as the Roman martyrology that Timothy was a bishop at Ephesus. In light of his appending demise, Paul's letter focuses on the job of an evangelist, which in this early Christian age embraces promoting and safeguarding all the major sources and repositories of divine revelation. So we see sacred tradition. Now, now oh, by the way, this is a difference between Catholic and Protestant worldview. Um, Protestants are sola scriptura, so they only respect sacred scripture. Catholics are not, so they also hold that there is sacred tradition passed down from the apostles, which is equal to sacred scripture, even though it is unwritten often and just oral, occurring in things like liturgies and hymns and prayers and things like that. So, but we see evidence of sacred tradition here in this letter, in t chapter 2, verses 1 to 2. Um, Paul manifests a very great concern that the traditions be maintained without loss. Um, second, there's sacred scripture, is mentioned in chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. Then Paul also conveys to Timothy that he needs to have a basic ecclesiology, a basic understanding of the church, in chapter 2, verses 20 to 21. And he also impresses upon Timothy the need to identify and avoid heresies, in chapter 2, verses 14 to 18. All these four things are grouped, uh, grouped under the job of an evangelist the, here during the apostolic age. In later centuries, after the apostles died, then these four things would separate and be crystallize as their own traditions. So sacred tradition and sacred scripture would be thought of as different things. But here we just see them all kind of jumbled up and grouped together under the quote, the quote, job of an evangelist, which is to maintain true, true doctrine and root out false doctrine. The focus of the letter is then correct doctrine. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of the life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved child, do not be ashamed, then, of testifying to our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner. You are aware that all who are in Asia turned away from me, and among them Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. He was not ashamed of my chains, but when he arrived in Rome, he searched for, for me eagerly and found me. I am suffering and wearing fetters like a criminal, for I am already on the point of being sacrificed. The time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with the present world, has des deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescanes has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is, he is very useful in serving me. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will requite him of his, for his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one took my part. All d deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and gave me strength to proclaim the message fully, that all the Gentiles might hear it. Greet Prisca and Aquila and the household of Anesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth. Trophimus I left ill at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greeting to you, as do Pudanes and Linus and Claudia and all the brethren. The next epistle is the epistle to the Philippians, which is Paul's last epistle. This letter was certainly written from a military base somewhere, 
New, that mean because it mentions a Praetorium in 113, which is part of a military base. So it probably occurred in the vicinity of Rome, in the vicinity of the um, Praetorian Guards outpost there on the northern side of Rome. Um, and then it was, there's also references to some sort of judicial misfortune for Paul in 112 and an upcoming trial or maybe even just sentencing in chapter 2, verse 23. So that all that would indicate Rome. Rome is also indicated by three other things. Um, he has hope of release. Oh, I'm sorry, never mind. The other things in this letter is that there is hope of release in 1, 2, and 1, 4 through 26, but also awareness of possible death in 2, 17, 3, 10 to 11, and also verses 14 and 20. Um, mention of Caesar's household occurs in 422, and that is the strongest piece of evidence that this letter was written from Rome. The constant theme of it repeated 12 times and fittingly supplemented with the famous whatsoever's poem in chapter 4, verse 8, is the command to rejoice. So the focus of, of the letter is joy at death. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. I want you to know, brethren, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brethren have been made confident in the Lord because of my imprisonment and are much more bold to speak the word of God without fear. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith because of my coming to you again. Whether I come and see you or, I, or am absent, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not on, only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same struggle which you saw and now hear to be mine. Even if I am to be poured out as a libation upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. I hope in the, in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered by news of you. I have no one like him. He will be genuinely anxious for your welfare. They all look after their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But Timothy's worth, you know. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go for, with me here. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself shall come also. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Therefore, I press on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature be thus minded. I entreat Euodia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And I ask you also, true yokeful fellow, namely maybe Barnabas or Silas, to please help these women, for they have labored side by side with me in the, in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. I have received full payment and more. I am filled, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you especially those of Caesar's household. As part of Nero's persecution of Christians in 64 AD, following the great fire of Rome, both Peter and Paul were executed. 
Peter was crucified upside down in the Circus of Nero, Nero, where the obelisk in Vatican Square stands today. Paul is traditionally held to have been beheaded at a site south of Rome, where today stand, stands the basilica in his honor, named St. Paul Outside the Walls, San Paolo Fuori le Mure. And that is the end of the life of Paul.